The tide of political popularity can turn very quickly, and in Japan, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is trying to change the current. His approval rating was sitting at about 60% just three months ago. It's now closer to 33%, the lowest level since he reclaimed the role of PM in 2012. Critics have accused him of favoritism. He's had to publicly address accusations he helped an old friend in a business deal involving a veterinary practice. His protégé in the Liberal Democratic Party, Defence Minister Tomomi Inada, was forced to resign last week. Inada was seen as an important backer of Abe's nationalistic views, including his push to revise the pacifist constitution by 2020. She had urged people to vote for the party in the recent Tokyo City elections as a request from the self-defense forces. They are meant to be politically neutral. <laughs> The party suffered a massive defeat in the Tokyo elections, its worst ever result in a Tokyo poll. It was a local election, but it was a signal to the Prime Minister that politics as usual is not popular. Shinzo Abe has become synonymous with the economic platform bearing his name, Abenomics, which has been driving the world's third largest economy since 2013, in a bid to reinvigorate the economy and leave behind decades of on-off deflation. He introduced the Three Arrow Model, monetary easing, fiscal stimulus and structural reforms. Because, as one Japanese proverb says, three sticks together are harder to break than one. Their ultimate goal is to boost domestic demand and raise inflation to 2%. The Bank of Japan had aimed to reach that figure in 2015. It's now projecting it'll happen in 2020. The International Monetary Fund's latest forecast is that Japan's economy will grow by 1.3% this year. Abenomics has helped to boost corporate profits, but the trickle-down benefits to individuals haven't been so clear-cut. And now that Abe himself is under political pressure, will he attempt to change the nation's economic course to ensure his own future? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Tokyo is Takuji Okubo. He's the chief economist of the Japan Risk Forum, an association of chief risk officers of major financial institutions and non-financial businesses in Japan. And in Norwich in the UK, Ra Mason. He's the Sasasqua lecturer in international relations and Japanese foreign policy at the University of East Anglia. Gentlemen, good to have both of you here with us. Uh, Takuji, let me start with you because critics are saying that Arbenomics have failed. Four years on, inflation still hasn't risen. What's your response to that? Well, uh, there are many aspects of economy, but if you look at uh, unemployment rate, unemployment rate is uh, one of the lowest in the last 20 years. At 2.8%, I, I, I should say it's the lowest uh, among developed economies. And then uh, corporate profits has doubled in the last five years. So, you know, of course, uh, you, you cannot have everything, but then I think economics has made progress in a certain area. So why then is the global perspective that Arbenomics hasn't succeeded? Right. Well, uh, there has been no, well, virtually no structural reform. I think uh, despite the popularity until recently, Prime Minister Abe did fail to deliver uh, his, uh, his promise on structural reform. So there has been a failure uh, on the structural reform. And then, of course, as you mentioned earlier, there has been very little inflation. But then I think uh, it was just too ambitious uh, for Bank of Japan and the government to try to achieve 2% inflation in just a few years. It takes time and it will come. Well, you, you hit the nail on the head there when you mentioned Abe's popularity. Has Abenomics been one of the nails in his coffin?
Uh, yes, so as I mentioned, I think Abe, Prime Minister Abe has uh, relatively little to show when it comes to economic reform. So there, there is a perception, uh, both within Japan and outside Japan, he has failed in delivering that. So, and then on top of that, there has been numerous scandals. So I do believe that the Prime Minister's uh, Abe's uh, policy of uh, expansive fiscal and monetary policy is the right way for Japan. So the, the risk that the Prime Minister Abe may have to step down, this may derail Japan's progress. Yeah, well, let, let me bring Ra in here because, you know, gosh, how much has changed since 2012 when uh, Japan couldn't get enough of Shinzo Abe. He was extremely popular and his uh, whole Arbonomics uh, policy uh, was a big hit. How much has changed since then? Well, quite a lot has changed, evidently, um, particularly in terms of um, the uh, security-related reforms. So it should be borne in mind here that although uh, Abenomics may, as, as was pointed out, have several factors which have been quite successful, if you look under the surface, it's actually the case that Abe's security-based reforms have not been um, endorsed by the public. And he's, this is largely a kind of personal or close um, sort of close circle set of policies which he's trying to push in tandem with that agenda of Abenomics. This is his pet policy of trying to uh, rewrite the constitution to give Japan uh, a, a, its own defence force again? Absolutely. And, and this is a, you know, a, a policy which has, has not, as I say, not been backed by the public. It's also received widespread opposition. And slowly, the, the kind of directive to try and drive through and force through some of those policies towards constitutional revision have actually ended up leaking in towards those scandals. So the, the, one of the most recent scandals involving the um, storage of JSDF, Self-Defense Force, logs in South Sudan, it could be argued is certainly something which might have been damaging to Prime Minister Abe in terms of um, uh, not accurately reflecting the risks which the JSDF faces in zones such as South Sudan. So it's not the case that he can any longer kind of completely disconnect these scandals from his own personal political agenda, which is not always entirely popular. Yeah, so, so this, this scandal involving his defence minister is uh, just one of several scandals. Um, uh, Takuji, you're in Tokyo. I mean, how much of this uh, has really flattened Shinzo Abe? He's got the, the, the defence minister scandal over that peacekeeping uh, issues in South Sudan, uh, but also these, these mm. school approval uh, scandals mm. where he's accused of showing favouritism to his friends. Uh, what is the mood there about all of this? Right. Well, I think if you look at uh, 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 the past popularity of prime ministers, I think Japanese vote, uh, voters tend to care more about the sincerity of the prime minister uh, or more. In, so, so I think economic success uh, seems to count less. So although Prime Minister Abe has delivered on economic front, as I mentioned, you know, low unemployment rate, high profits, uh, slightly, you know, small rising wages. So he did deliver, but then uh, the scandal is really hurting, and I don't think he has actually is uh, he's ready to get and uh, take back the control. So at this at this rate, I, I think I do think his popularity will continue uh, to decline, and I don't think he will survive uh, to uh, end of 2018 as a prime minister. Yeah, that, that's a really uh, interesting point, Ra. His approval rating has dropped to 26 percent, which some, uh, well, according to one poll, which some analysts are saying is the death zone, and, and several previous MPs who've, mm. who've gone that low have left. Where, where do you think he is with that, Ra? Do you think he's going to actually yeah. have to step down in 2018? Um, well, I think that's less clear in the sense right. that the, uh, there's, well, there's various things in play here. But Sorry, Takuji, let Ra answer those... this and I'll come back to you. So, sorry if I may. Um, so, so I think one of the interesting factors there is the way in which this is being reported. Only one um, of, the, of the major polls has actually listed his approval rating as low as that. And if, for example, you take a poll of polls, um, it, it seems that actually his overall approval rating is closer to something like in the low 30s of percent, so 32 or 33 percent. 
Um, and there are various areas where, it, where he would be able to readjust against some of those scandals in order to possibly bolster his approval ratings in well, the short he's term. He's going to have to bolster him a lot, even if it's 32, 33 percent. That's still pretty low. Well, not necessarily, because Abe doesn't have a powerful opponent, certainly not um, in the opposition. So he's probably his most powerful opponents come from within his own party in the LDP, figures like the current um, Foreign and Defence, well, now Defence Secretary, due to Inada's um, you know, resignation after her scandal, so uh, Mr. Kishida Fumio, um, and also Mr. Ishiba Shigeru, Shigeru, who is no longer in the cabinet, but is a powerful figure within the LDP. So those two figures, for example, are both have shown fairly openly a degree of criticism towards Abe, despite being um, very strong LDP um, or very strong characters within the LDP party itself. So there is a potential for him to perhaps lose his power base within the LDP. But low approval ratings are being pitched against the complete kind of disarray, which is the opposition in Japan, which means that even a low approval rating does not necessarily spell political demise. Takuji, what do you think of that? And is there an alternative or a credible rival to Mr Abe? Right. Well, I, I do believe that a uh, credible rival will appear. Uh, so, you know, when, he, uh, when a prime, sta sitting prime minister is popular, of course, it's very dangerous to oppose him. So nobody will, you know, step up. But now that the popularity is low, uh, there will be rivals. I don't think uh, the lack of rival is actually the issue. Um, so a lucky, lucky uh, issue for Prime Minister Abe is there's no national election until the end of next year. So, but then, unless he can recover his popularity before, say, mid-2018, I think the ruling party will find, uh, you know, alternative, uh, suitable alternatives. We know that uh, Shinzo Abe is uh, looking at a major cabinet reshuffle. Can he regain any ground with that? Hmm. Right. Um, I, I don't think so. I, so we, we, don't, we, we still don't know the details of all the names uh, of our next cabinet. But then as I see it, I don't think uh, Prime Minister Abe actually get the feeling of the voters that the, the voters uh, is uh, demanding him to do a complete reshuffle. But then Prime Minister Abe hasn't really realized the depth of his trouble. Do you agree with that, Ra? I mean, do, do, it's, it's got to a point where it might not make a difference and he doesn't realize how... Uh, how badly damaged he is at this point? Well, I think there may be some overconfidence in that area, but I think still we shouldn't underestimate Prime Minister Abe. Don't forget that he is somebody who, despite being opposed by various factions, has successfully charted one of the longest stints as Prime Minister of Japan in post-Cold War history and is looking down the barrel at potentially being able to lay the ground for an, an unprecedented third term in office. So using this reshuffle, which is going to take place in two days' time, to perhaps galvanize his own closest supporters and possibly push to the fringes some of those that might more prominently oppose him is something which he will definitely be looking to do. And perhaps we shouldn't judge too soon as to the efficacy of, of, of that reshuffle. Well, what will people be looking for in that reshuffle? I mean, should he fire his defence minister, for example? Well, I mean, his defence minister, Inada, has already resigned. Um, so this means that the position is effectively opened up. And I think it's unlikely that he would leave the current foreign minister, who is uh, Fumio Kishida, in, in that role. He's there as interim. But this is a, a man who is a, also a powerful figure within the LDP and potentially could oppose Abe. So I think we might see him replace that role in the, in the defence uh, minister role with somebody who is... Um, up and coming, somebody that could perhaps uh, work closely with him, as he, he himself thought was, would be the case with, uh, with um, Inada Tomomi, um, and she un unfortunately became embroiled in this, in this scandal. So I think we might see one or two fresh faces, and we may see um, some of those who are most likely to oppose him being pushed somewhat to the fringes. Takuji, just explain for us, why uh, are some of these other policies of Abe's uh, so unpopular? For example, uh, shifting the country's defence policy uh, and allowing Japanese troops to fight overseas for the first time since World War II. Why has that been seen so negatively in Japan? 
Right. Well, I think uh, ja uh, Japanese public in general uh, th feel they are still not ready. They haven't actually done a proper, you know, uh, recounting of uh, what went wrong before World War II. And then, you know, Prime Minister Abe, and, you know, he's more of a nationalist, I would say, revisionist uh, group, where uh, they, they secretly feel that uh, Japan actually did nothing wrong in World War II. So I think uh, uh, Japanese public actually feel uh, that kind of uh, insincer insincerity. So I, I think without, um, you know, rec more deeper reconciliation of uh, how Japan want to position in the current uh, modern world, I think Japanese public would feel very skeptical of uh, being able to send army overseas, fight with U.S. I don't think Japanese public is ready for that. OK, very, very quickly, if Abe goes, does Abenomics go too? I think there's a good chance. Uh, I think uh, there's a strong lobby among Japanese banking against uh, Crowdonomics, Abenomics, so there's a good chance that uh, his policy could be derailed. OK, gentlemen, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Good to have you with us, Takuji Okubo and Ra Mason.